So, inshallah, I want to, uh, you know, while we're in this time together, I want, to, I want us just to make some intentions. I, I want us just to jam-pack these last moments that we have of Yom Al Jumu'ah together. I, like this moment is, uh, thank you Jazakallah khair. This moment of Yom Al Jumu'ah is a time where the Prophet said there's a, there's a special hour, right? There's a special hour on the day of Jumu'ah that you want to make dua at that time, right? Because the dua is mustajab. And so many of our scholars believe that that hour, subhanAllah, is that time, like right before uh, Maghrib comes in, like that time between Asr and Maghrib, that last moment. Because after we prayed Salah al Jumu'ah, we've recited our Quran, and I want to say a big jazakallah, ad, ad khayr for the recitation. That just, subhanAllah, just healed my heart, even as I was coming in. But subhanAllah, we don't, we want to catch it, right? We know that this is, there, this is a time where that barakah is descending. And when the Prophet وسلم, said barakah is descending, it's like a blessed rain. And, and that blessed rain is something we want to catch. There's some people, when there's a barakah that's descending or a blessed rain that's descending, they bring their cup. And they say, let me catch some of it. I, or there's some, excuse me. They go out and they just expose themselves to it. Like, here I am, Mr. Jumu'ah, I came, alhamdulillah. And that's what they got, whatever, you know, drizzle came onto them. And there are some people who come with a cup and they said, let me catch some of this blessing that I may nourish myself or give some to my child by it. And then there's others who say, let me dig a trench. Let me prepare for this blessing that I may benefit from it all year round. My family, my neighborhood, my entire community may benefit from it. And so we want to be from amongst those people. We're asking, Ya Allah, by this, on this day of Jummah, and this special hour, do not let this day close except that you've written us from amongst the true believers. Ya Rabbi, we intend by being in your, in your house, right, in this hour, at this time, we intend to be with the Prophet Wasallam in our actions, in our deeds, in our character, in our spirituality, in this dunya and the akhirah. Arabi, I intend to give victory to his way. Arabi, we intend to strengthen the ummah of the Prophet Muhammad Wasallam. We intend to, to, to give victory to those who are in Philistine. We intend to be a means of mercy for them. We intend to be a means of light and hope for them. We intend this for our brothers and sisters in Philistine and Lebanon and in Syria and in Yemen and in Afghanistan and in the Congo and in Sudan. We intend to let them know that their brothers and sisters love them. We intend to send dua for them. We intend to please Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala by being in this gathering and sending salawat on the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And by this, because Allah loves the Prophet, we intend to attach ourselves to everything that Allah loves and who he loves. We intend to sit with the ulama. <laughs> we intend to be in the company of the righteous. We intend that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would grant us his nadar, his gaze of rida. We intend that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, by us being in his house, in this moment, at this time, seeking him and gathered for no other reason except him, we intend that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would make this moment a means by which we're saved from the torment of the grave and the punishment of the hellfire. And our entire lineage will be from amongst those that are saved. That our entire lineage and those that we love and our family members and our friends and those who pray for us and support us would be from amongst those who enter into Jannah to Firdaus al-Ala wa Habib Allah Muhammad sallallahu wa sallam wa We intend that all of our affairs would be rectified. We intend that Allah in this moment that you would heal our hearts by mentioning you by mentioning the Prophet ﷺ. We intend that our deen would be fortified. We intend that we would be the people of Yaqeen, the people of Ma'rifah. We intend to expose ourselves to Allah's mercy and His expansion. We intend to expose our hearts to Allah's light. We intend to expose our hearts to our fulfillment of our purpose. We intend that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would number us, write our names from amongst those who are, who are the successful ones, who are the happy ones, the, the, the ones that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has chosen as his elite. We intend to everything that Allah intended of khair for the people on the earth and all of our teachers, we intend that for them as well. 
We intend that our teachers would be elevated by this moment, that our teachers would increase in knowledge by this moment. We intend that by this moment, our teachers, with their hearts would continuously be expanded and that we would blessed to be in their blessed company. We intend to feed orphans, to, to home, to give them a home, to clothe them. We intend to be a means of a better future and a brighter future for them. We intend that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would grant us a victory from his victory fi dunya wa akhirah and that we and our families will be saved from the fitna of Masih al-Dajjal. Allahumma ameen. So I want to start by saying that when we talk about mending the hearts, you know, the, the nature of the heart is that it's, it's a part of the soul, it's the greater part of the soul. There are four aspects to the soul. And the matter of the heart is that, that having qalban saliman is something so significant because if it is broken, as you just, if you have any vessel and you want to pour something inside of it, of course, by nature, I, it's gonna seep out. So when our hearts are broken, we're not able to be a sound vessel, a sound container for knowledge or for spirituality, right? Literally, and I want to talk about the type of, uh, we're gonna talk about inshallah, the different types of broken hearts. And when that heart is broken, and it doesn't have, subhanAllah, even the right healing, like for example, I'm not very good at uh, all of the building materials, so you'll forgive me. But I know that you know how you, you, you have a vase, right? It's a beautiful vase and it's broken, subhanAllah, and you put, you know, maybe just some, you found some super glue, right? You put some super glue on it, you know, you just want to, you know, you want to just put it back together. You just want it to make it look like it's together. We say, you know, don't touch it, it's broken, <laughs> right? Don't, don't touch it, it's, you know, it's, it will easily fall apart, it's very fragile. We don't want that type of epoxy. We want the type that will, like, seal it as if it were never broken, right? That it would seal it in a way, subhanAllah, that it would actually become new. They would look at it, someone would look at it and say, wow, I never, I never imagined that this heart was broken. And so when we look at uh, broken hearts, again, there are different types of broken hearts. And it depends on what broke it and who broke it, right? And how it got broken. There's the type of heart, broken heart that happens, for example, like the one that we're experiencing as a result of dhulam, as a result of oppression. That when we see people, subhanAllah, in positions that we just feel so weak, that we feel so insignificant, that there's something we want to do about it, but watching them, subhanAllah, and their, you know, and all of their suffering, that breaks our hearts. But that type of stuff, that kind of broken heart is a good broken heart. That kind of like, yeah, Allah, I don't have, you know, I don't have the means. That kind of broken heart is the kind that, subhanAllah, Allah can mend. Right? Allah can mend all of them, but it's the type that you want Allah to mend. You, it's, a, it's a type of brokenness that you want to present yourself to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in this broken state. Right? To say, yeah, Allah, I recognize how limited I am. I recognize how weak I am. I recognize my own smallness. And so I present to you my brokenness, asking you, Ya Al-Jabbar, Ya Al-Qawi, Ya al mateen fix this. <laughs> fix this. That's one type. Inshallah, we'll, we'll, um, we're just gonna list the types and we'll come back and, and talk more in detail about them later. There's another type of broken heart that happens as the result of life events. Someone died, a divorce, someone you know that you love very closely, something about that relationship is severed. Uh, that type of broken heart is different, right? There's a, there's a sense of, of literal loss, there's a grief that's there. And you know, subhanAllah, I was looking at some statistics about, you know, I remember in my own life, there was a time when my heart was so broken. I actually, you know, I could, I could feel it. You know that feeling where like you, it feels like it's like there's a hole, right? And you wonder, Ya Allah, will this hole ever be filled? 
Is there any way, like, will it ever come together again? Will I, will this feeling, this, this, so I'm in love, this deep rift in my chest, will it ever go away? But by Allah's grace and mercy, I don't feel it now. I, I don't feel not only that brokenness, but that empty space in between where you feel as if there's a, there's a darkness there, right? And so subhanAllah, we, we learn how over time, through events, through Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala saying, you've learned that lesson, so now I've replaced that. Well, I've put, put something there. I've put a healing medicine on it. So that's one type of broken heart. There's another type of brokenness that comes from spiritual diseases, that comes from spiritual ailments, that come from, how we would say, things that are like old types of things that can arise from our nafs, from our ego, that can happen as a result of many. Give me some uh, more spiritual diseases. Vanity, grief, lust, desire, hate. All of those things can actually cause deep sicknesses in the heart, especially if left untreated. If they're left to a state of like, ah, oh, I know that I'm in a state of ghafla and that I'm indulging it. I know that I'm in a state of laziness and I'm indulging it. And there's a, it can be compounded when especially it, uh, it, it, it's left to be in its, in its literally disease state. When it's left to kind of like pass over and just let it be there. There's another type that's as a result of, of, of a deep, deep, deep anger that becomes like a, a rage and that kind of rage can become a rancor and left untreated literally it, it can become treachery it, be, it can become a type of bitterness that that heart becomes becomes so hard right that that heart becomes so hard in its rigidness that anything right chips away at it any event any life event that you know the smallest thing happened I came into the masjid and someone bumped my shoulder, right? That's why I don't come to the masjid. That's why I don't hang around with these people. That's why I don't, you know, because all the Muslims are like that. That's a hardened heart. That literally, subhanAllah, that kind of rigidness, it just, it literally just chips away. The smallest thing will cause it to fall apart. Each one of these, Alhamdulillah, has its treatment, has its cure. Is that the other? Mm -hmm. It will come. Five more minutes, Alhamdulillah. <laughs> the amazing thing about our beloved Prophet is that he's a heart doctor. <laughs> The amazing thing about the beloved messenger of Allah sallallahu is that even his name is a healing. That sending salawat on him is a healing. To have remembrance of him is a healing. To read about him is a healing. To implement his way is a healing. That everything about him Subhanallah wa bihamdihi subhanallah al -adhim, is a shifa. Which means you come at the right time. That you have excellent timing. That if you entered into this door with any form of a broken heart, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, This month, this moment is for you. That if you came into this month knowing Sayyidina. وَحَبِيبِنَا سِرَاجٍ مُنِيرٍ رَحْمَةِ الْعَالَمِينَ يَاسِينَ طَاهَا If you came into this building knowing the name of Habib Allah sallallahu wa sallam wa alayhi knowing that Ya Allah by your mercy you chose me to know him 
By your mercy, subhanAllah, you allowed me to be from his ummah, which means that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala intended healing for you. And the only reason you walked into this door is because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, I want to heal you. I want to fill those empty spaces. I want to soften that rigidity. I want to remove all of the, the disease and replace it with light and with nur. The subhanAllah wa bihamdihi, subhanAllah al -Azim. you're in the right place, at the right time, with the right people, knowing, having the right doctor. Allahumma salli wa sallam wa barika na sayyidina wa habibina wa maulana Muhammad. So when we think about, you know, how can I mend my broken heart? The great thing about it is like, we have an exact guidance, right? We have an exact way. Like, not only do we have his, you know, like his, um, do, not only do we have the book of instruction, right? We have the Prophet وسلم, himself and his example. And then there are two types of healing we will talk about today. And then inshallah we'll pause for that and then we'll come back. There are two types of healing. One, there is the self-healing. There is the recognition that I have a broken heart. I have a splintered soul. I'm in trouble. Okay, that's one healing. There's another type. When you are responsible, and all of us are responsible, for being a means of healing somebody else's broken heart. For being a, a means of mending their broken heart. And so the Prophet ﷺ is an example for us in both. That Walilah and Ham, we don't, Allah didn't send us a Prophet that actually we couldn't relate to. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent us a Prophet who experienced a broken heart. We all know that the beloved messenger of Allah ﷺ went through a year of sadness. Literally, subhanAllah, his family breaking his heart. Before that, his father being born, you know, without his father. Then, of course, the loss of his mother, the loss of his grandfather, then the loss of his uncle. And then, subhanAllah, when he experienced so much love and comfort from our mother Khadija radiallahu ta'ala anha al-kubra alayha salam, then, subhanAllah, then, then the separation of her. I, I know some of you are saying, why did you say alayha salam upon our mother Khadija? There's a, na a narration where once the Prophet وسلم, was coming home. And this was after the boycott. He was coming home and the angel Jibra'il stopped him in the middle. And he stopped him and he said, Khadija is preparing your favorite dish. And he said, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has a message for him. Now Allah sends salam on Khadija. And I send salam on Khadija. So from that narration, I used to think like, Ya Allah. You send salam. Um, she's not a prophet. She's not, but you send salam on her. And then you send Angel Jibra'il to the Messenger of Allah to tell us that you send salam on her. So that the angels would also send salam on her. Ya Allah. I don't know about you, but for me, that was a huge healing, especially as a woman. <laughs> the hope. The hope. So, this man is coming to tell us that is prayer time. Walillah <laughs> alham. Make dua between the adhan and the akama. For surely that, that time of dua is a dua mustajab. So, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Alhamdulillah rabbil alamin. Wa salatu wa salam ala sayyidina habibina mawlana muhammad wa alayhi wa sahbihi wa sallam. So we were talking about, of course, the state of our hearts and thinking about how the Messenger of Allah وسلم, first informed us about our hearts in the meaning of its brokenness, right? The different aspects of its brokenness. So first I want to talk about why does Allah break our hearts? Like why would Allah allow our hearts to be broken? So the first thing is, is that what, remember we talked about when that, uh-oh. 
too when we, I'm too powerful. <laughs> That's what she was like, I'm not, I'm like, <laughs> she's saying I'm powerful. I was like, I'm weak. I'm... <laughs> See? Okay, that the first thing is that when our hearts are broken, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allows the contents of it to literally be exposed to ourselves. So that when things happen and we begin to see, wow, I didn't realize that I had that level of attachment. I didn't realize that I, you know, had that level of weakness. Or I didn't realize that there was vanity there. Or I didn't realize that there was conceit there. Or sometimes, subhanAllah, the opposite. I didn't realize I had that much resilience. I didn't realize, subhanAllah, that I had that much strength. I didn't realize, subhanAllah, how much Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala was holding me together until there was something that actually caused it all to just fall apart. <laughs> and so a lot of times we look at our hearts as something that's, broke, that's broken as a result, but sometimes Allah is breaking into it. There's some aspects of it that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying, I'm breaking it because there's certain aspects of it that are no longer going to benefit you. There's some parts of your heart that you've become, that you've grown attached to. That's what kind of love we've got to let that go. And we need to grow some new things in its place. Or in other cases, there are some tumors, right? There are some diseases that you have inside of it. And in order, subhanAllah, to, because, you, because you won't let go of that thing or that person or that, uh, that trauma or that thing that's happening because of it, subhanAllah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, listen, I'm going to break your heart now, but don't worry. As a result, there's a, there's a, there's a sickness inside. I'm going to remove it. Right? And then once I remove it, I'm going to put it back together in a way that it never was before. Right? So this is some of the reason that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allows our hearts to be broken. Right? Not necessarily because it's it's uh not necessarily because it's a bad thing. Right? When we recognize my heart is broken because of certain, you know, negative things, then be grateful that Allah broke your heart. That might be difficult to be able to say, Ya Allah, you know me better than I know myself. And I've been making dua to go to Jannah. I've been making dua, right, for sometimes the highest levels of Jannah. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying, As, because you want that, and I want that for you, but this type of heart is not a Jannah heart, right? This type of heart, subhanAllah, this, this heart doesn't have the capacity to hold the kind of iman that's needed to get to that level. This type of heart doesn't have the, the level, it doesn't have the capacity, it doesn't have the strength to have the fortification that it needs to do the work that I need you to do. So as a result, subhanAllah, I'm going to break it so I can expand it. Right? So we thank Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala actually for that. That's the type of heart, that's the kind of broken heart that's meant for heart surgery. Right? Where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is repairing, subhanAllah, it's very similar to when the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, wa sallam, when the angel Jibra'il laid him down, right? Split open his chest and remove certain aspects, remove certain spots from his heart. Said that this, subhanAllah, you've got a mission to do. You've got a work to do. And because of that mission and that work you've got to do, I'm going to remove these things from your heart. Because if it continues to grow like it is, it can become bitterness. It can become hatred. It can become, it can grow into all kinds of things. It can actually consume you. So as a result, I'm going to break your heart in order to remove, to heal, to expand, to give you a new one. Sometimes we need a whole new one. Anybody ever felt like I just need a whole heart transplant? That, yes. <laughs> like I, just need a, I just need a new one, Ya Allah. <laughs> the one I have is broke. <laughs> I need a new one. Allahumma salli ala Sayyidina Habibina Mulana Muhammad wa alayhi wa sallam. So there are a couple of things that you also can do. If you know, you recognize, I have a broken heart. I recognize that the heart that I have doesn't have the capacity of the type of iman that I want. That I have a broken heart and it doesn't have the ability to love like I want it to love. 
It doesn't have the type of ability to attach to the things that Allah loves or attach to the people that Allah loves. Or for some reason, it doesn't have the ability to hold the Quran, right? It doesn't have the ability, right, to hold on and to, and to be attached to a certain type of knowledge. So if you recognize, right, there's some parts of your heart that's, you know, there's, there's something wrong. That's okay. Alhamdulillah. It's okay. Why? Because you at least have the type of heart that can recognize it, which means it's not dead. So the first thing, the first thing you want to do is make lots and lots and lots of istighfar. You want to make lots and lots and lots of toba. What toba says is, Ya Rabbi, I've been feeding my heart the wrong things. <laughs> I've been turning my heart and giving my heart the attention for the wrong things. So literally, tobas comes from taba, which means to turn around. Say, Ya Allah, let me expose my heart to your light, to your mercy, to your growth, to your expansion. So you turn around, right? And then you make a resolution. The first one is, I don't want to do that again. I don't want to do that again. Because I recognize that's leading me the wrong way and I, I'm not interested in going the wrong way. Right? So you turn around, you make a resolution, I'm not going to do that again. Then, if there's certain people in your life that you know, I, every time I'm with you, we commit this in. Every time I leave you, I always leave with this sickening feeling. I always leave with my heart more restricted, my heart more constricted, should I say. I don't leave with my heart expanded. I don't leave more full of light. I don't leave feeling well. I leave knowing something is wrong. So we got, you know, me and you, either we change, I have to change. Either something changes about the way that we relate to each other, or I'm going to have to change the way that I relate to you. See, boundaries are setting those boundaries to say, I, I need to grow in this way, right? And sometimes that's very difficult to do. Sometimes we feel like, I don't really have the words to say that, Sister Aisha. What do I say? We just say, I'm trying to go to heaven, <laughs> right? And there's just some things, some changes I have to make in my life because I'm trying to go to heaven. Or just keep it, you know, even more so like, I'm real scared these days. You know, I was, I was learning about hell. It looks, it sounds real horrible and I can't go. Not even for a minute. <laughs> it's not gonna work out for me. And again, sometimes the, those boundaries are about, I love you, I, and that's part of the problem. That my love for you causes me to accept certain things that I shouldn't. And I recognize, subhanAllah, the way that you live your life. And although I, I respect that that's the way you live your life, I understand that's the way you deal with your heart. But I can't allow you to be reckless with mine. I can't allow you to be reckless with my life or reckless with my akhirah or reckless with my heart. So it doesn't mean that I don't care about you. I will continue to make dua for you. I, I definitely, you know, I just have to make certain decisions about how I want to handle my life. It's just maybe we have different values about the way you handle your life and the way you handle your heart. And I have to kind of determine and decide for myself the way I want to handle my heart because that's gonna determine how I handle my life. Right. And so it's okay to set gently, lovingly, set those boundaries. I love you. This is not gonna work out. <laughs> not me and you. Me and you no. gonna always work out. Right? <laughs> I, I love. So that's you know, and you and you leave it at that. So that's one aspect. Another thing, alhamdulillah, this is like shout out to Dr. Rania, <laughs> is that if you know your heart is broken, and it's broken from a, a deep trauma. 
or deep pain. That's okay. Nobody's the same way if you broke your leg. Nobody's expecting you to get up and run a marathon. Nobody's expecting you to go, you know, beat Shikari Richardson. Nobody's expecting that of you. Some of you are like, who? Don't worry. Right? Nobody's expecting you to go run a 100-meter race, right? Nobody's expecting that of you if you broke your leg. Sometimes you have to go to the doctor. You broke your leg, it's, you know, you got to go to the doctor. I need help. I need, I need physical therapy. There is actually a such thing as a broken heart syndrome. Where people, as we all know, if you've ever experienced a broken heart, you know that a broken heart releases cortisol in your brain. It reduces stress hormones in your brain. Right? It's in your brain, right? Cortisol. Somewhere. That's what she's for. See what I'm saying? <laughs> That's why you go to the doctor. <laughs> right? Don't go to the teacher. Go to the doctor. That it releases a stress hormone. Right? You literally start to feel it in your body. Which is why when it goes untreated, you literally, subhanAllah, go into a depression, you're just sick, right? I just don't want to get out of bed. You start to feel pain in your body. When you have that kind of broken heart, it's like I, you go to the doctor and say, I need help. I need some guidance. I'm walila and hum, preferably you go to someone, because we have them available, who's trained in our tradition. Someone who can, subhanAllah, of course, treat you from the Qur'an that is a healing and a mercy a shifa or rahmah who can give you the tools sometimes it's true we just weren't we just weren't taught certain things we just weren't you know there's there's certain things that just weren't a part of our you know that that it's not in our literacy bank it's not in our emotional literacy right we just don't know them we just don't have those tools in our toolbox not everyone grew up with like the most emotionally intelligent community or the most emotionally intelligent parents. Not everybody grew up with that. So we don't all necessarily have those tools and that's not bad. It just recognize like, I don't know quantum physics, right? I don't. When I need it for something, like even when I like chemical engineering, I don't know chemical engineering. When it comes time to like, okay, we got to figure out how we're going to get rid of these parasites in this water. I'm going to a chemical engineer because they know. I, so in this case, go to somebody who can help you. And that's not, I don't want, you know, subhanAllah, we have so much stigma around it in our community. We think, oh, that's backbiting. I don't want us. No, alhamdulillah. Do you, you're trying to have confidentiality, right? Of course. Of course. You're not going to put out their business in the community, right? Of course not. Of course not. So I don't want us to see that as something that subhanAllah would be, you know, uh, that would be backbiting. Sometimes it's just we need to get the skills, right? We need to, we need to learn new we need to learn new habits, new ways of communicating, new ways of relating with people, new ways for how to navigate our own life, new ways for actually how to talk and to deal with our own hearts. So that's one aspect. The next one is that I cannot express to you how much, subhanAllah, the Qur'an. The Qur'an is a shifa or rahmah. It is a healing and a mercy. But I want it to you to recite it, not just in a manner that's on your tongue, but to recite the Quran from your heart. That's when you're reciting. Recite it from your heart. Reciting, you know, with the intention of healing your heart, with the intention of exposing yourself to all of its healing qualities and its expansion. When you're reading it, right, let your, let the, you know, they say the, the eyes are the windows to the soul. Let it sink into your heart. Take time to ponder on its meanings. That somehow, subhanAllah, bihamdi, subhanAllah, adim, I don't know what happened, but somehow we gave meditation over to other traditions. Right? Right? But meditation is something that is, that is directly prophetic. From Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. What was he doing in the cave for 30 days? What was he doing? 
He was meditating. He was reflecting over his own state, over his role and position in the world, over the magnificence of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, about his life's purpose. He was meditating. And he had it as a regular practice. And the more and more revelation is, it was coming to him, the more and more he increased his time in meditation. You have to have time where actually you're listening to your heart. You actually have to have time to sit and, and actually say to your heart, how are you? Why are you so angry? Why are you so sad? Or I actually don't know what I'm feeling because I haven't had a chance to let it sink in for a minute. So you need those moments where you're li you, ha you have to have a relationship with your heart so that it can have a relationship with you. You have to have time where you're sitting and you're talking to it and you're allowing your heart to speak back to you. Then and only then, will you know its level, its health or not? Its health or sickness? And what is the nature of its health or its sickness? And then, Asma al Husna, bi dhikrillah. ذكري لا فطمعين قلوب that the dhikr of the dhikr of Allah is something where the hearts find rest right it's something where the hearts find rest it's where the hearts subhanallah find healing This takes a certain type of patience with yourself. Allowing your heart, subhanAllah, to, to have, there, there has to be where you push back the dunya. And you take time to sit with yourself and literally to reflect over the names of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Out of the asma and husna, there are, what I would say, cures, right, for different diseases of the heart. So this is something you want to take your time with. Take time, subhanAllah, I can tell you that literally even reciting those names of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala from your heart. By the way, when you, when you recite the names of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala from your heart, it's going gonna, it's gonna to come out in a different voice than when you're saying it, let's say, from your lungs. Or when you're saying it from your head. You might be surprised the voice that it comes out. It might not be that strong, powerful voice or that, you know, that like I got it voice. It might come out broken. So just be prepared that when you recite the Asma and Husna from your heart, it might sound like a very different voice. The next thing is, is that you've got to, you've got to give it nourishment. The heart needs nourishment. Dikr is a part of its food. Qiyamul layl. That khalwa with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That khalwa with Allah Azza wa Jal, that's subhanAllah, that's a that's a that's a that's a feast for the heart. Moments where you can stand in the middle of the night. And yes, I want you to stand, subhanAllah. And if you can recite the Quran, of course, as much as you can, as much as you can. Stand in the night and recite Quran, but also I want you to make dua to Allah in the middle of the night. I'm not I'm not talking about just Quranic dua. I'm talking about when you're like, no one's listening. You know, whether for me it's like in my walk-in closet, or I'm distant from other people, or in sujood when you whisper. 
the moment where you literally talk to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and you admit your brokenness and you say, Ya Allah, I'm so broken. I don't even know how to fix it. Oh, I'm so sad. Or, Ya Rabbi, I'm so happy. <laughs> That's also true, right? Ya Rabbi, I am so happy. Please keep me happy. Right? Ya Allah, this love I'm experiencing is so great. Ya al -Wadul, thank you. Ya Rabbi, thank you. Give shukr. Ya Rabbi, I gotta tell you. I got something. I got so I just want to talk to you about it. Oh, Ya Rabbi, I'm so confused. I don't even, my heart is not matching with my mind. We are out of alignment. Hold on to the robe of Allah and don't be divided. Mostly we talk about this as it relates to the community. I'm talking about the community of self. When my mind is going one way, my heart is going another. My soul is saying, no, we should go up. My mind is saying, no, we have to focus on the dunya because of these bills. Right? My heart is like, but I really like this person. My heart is going in another direction. You need an alignment. Y'all be making me a reflection of Tawheed. الَّذِينَ عَامِنُوا تَتَمَعُونَ قُلُوبُهُمْ بِذِكِرِ اللَّهِ عَلَى بِذِكِرِ اللَّهِ تَتَمَعُونَ قُلُوبُ That the translation is those who have believed and whose hearts are assured by the remembrance of Allah unquestionably by the remembrance of Allah hearts are assured. The first part is الَّذِينَ عَامِنُوا you have to have, Aminu is like, it's, it's not just like faith. It's like, there's, this is where I, I understand that this is where my safety is. It's not just, I believe in Allah. Right? It's not just Shahada. It's not just Shahada. It's like, Ya Allah, I know that you're my security. I know that you're my safety. I have certainty about that. So sometimes it's like, I've submitted, right? I have Islam, I've submitted, but to be mu'min is, is another matter. So that means, right? But for those who, who understand that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is their safety, that Allah is their refuge. For those, when, they, when, when the, the more and more, and by the way, the way you build up from just submission to belief, right? Is dhikr Allah. But the one who understands, Ya Rabbi, this is my safety, so that's why I run to you. You're my true refuge. It's like a, it's like a, a, a cycle. The more you remember Allah, the more your heart, will, the more you will increase Iman. The more you increase in Iman, the more you increase in that surety, that certainty that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is your refuge and your security. The more you have that, the more you make dhikr of Allah, right? The more your heart will be calm. See, there's a certain time our hearts are like this. We're in a state of duress and we're in a state of worry, in a state of stress. Then there's another time you're like, you ever been in a certain situation? You're like, I've been here so many times before. Shaitan, you can't get me. I've seen Allah rescue me from this so many times. I've seen this already. But the way that happens is you actually got to remember Allah. You got to remember those moments like, yeah, we did this before. Allah came to my rescue. I'm grateful, Ya Rabbi. I know you. You're the rescuer. You won't come to me again. Be idni rabbi. And you tell me stories and over and over and over again in the Quran about how you came to their rescue. So that one, dhikr Allah, qiyam layl, Quran. The next one is khidma. Khidma, khidma, 
Khidma. Serve somebody else. Get your mind off your own problems. Trust me, there are people who have bigger problems than you. Right? There are people who are, and you're thinking that, subhanAllah, you, we may have a lot of problems. There's a privilege that you have that you can serve from that privilege. Right? Even if it's something small, you can wash dishes, subhanAllah. You can come uh, read to somebody who's elderly. You can just go bring them, drop them off a bag of groceries. You can provide for them even something small. From your privilege that you have, you can benefit somebody else. And sometimes in that khidmah, right, you start to become grateful for your own situation. So khidmah helps. Khidmah is a huge healer. So that's when, subhanAllah, you're in a state of mending your own heart. Now I want to talk about how you are when you are the one who's responsible for helping others. How did the Prophet وسلم, heal the hearts of others? The first one, which I just find to, me, to be honest so amazing, is he came to their level and was relatable. That yes, he is the messenger of Allah sallallahu but he would literally relate to them. Right? People would come to them with, with all kinds of problems as we're very familiar. There's a woman who had mental illness and she would come to the Prophet sallallahu and said, Ya Rasulullah, like, I need you. I need you. I just need to talk to you. And he would say, choose any street, any alley in Medina. I'll be there. And she would find him and he would sit with her on the street in Medina, not paved like we have now. No street cleaners, like he'd sit up with her and let her talk and get it out. Talk therapy. He would listen to her for hours, subhanAllah. Now, of course, most of us were like, listen, <laughs> Uh, I'm busy. I have like 200 people. I got to pick up my kids from school. <laughs> In addition to that, I got to get dinner on the table by 7 o'clock. Um, I've got work. Right? He could have said there are a number of people within the community that you can talk to. He didn't say, don't you know I'm the messenger of Allah? How many people want to talk to me? He said, choose a street. I'll be there. You'll find me. He was relatable, even to children. He comes from the battle of Uhud, one of the most difficult moments in the life of the Prophet وسلم, where literally he has seen his companions dismembered. On the, in the battle of Uhud, the companions say, we never heard a groan from the Prophet وسلم, like we heard in that moment when he saw his uncle Hamza. And yet, when he returned back from that battle, he heard that one of the children, that children in his community, his, his pet bird, Umayyah, had lost his bird. Hey, so he said to him, he got down and he said, tell me about your bird, what he used to do. Meaning he had the moment just to relate, I, I understand loss. You lost your bird. He just wanted to take a minute to, to let him know that I didn't forget you. I know that that bird was important to you. How many times we come home and our children want to tell us something? Right? Or something happened with them. But we don't, maybe they're upset about something that happened at school. Maybe we're so busy in our own affairs, we don't take the time to mend their heart. Or take the time to even listen to their heart. How was school? Fine. It was fine. Are we listening for those subtleties? Hmm. That sounds... Tell me what was fine about it. Were there any struggles? We have to just take those moments to, to listen. Make yourself available. As we know, one of my favorite moments in the life of the Prophet ﷺ, he's talking to Umar, and him and Umar are like, you know, chatting it up. A woman comes directly to the Prophet ﷺ and interrupts them. 
I'm like, this woman is bold. <laughs> Fine. Like, the Prophet, I want you to imagine this scene. The Prophet وسلم, the Messenger of Allah, is talking to Omar ibn Khattab. <laughs> right? Most of us would be like, yeah, mm, no, I'm going to wait. <laughs> right? There were women that when Omar had been to a room, they ran behind the curtain. Not this woman. This woman right, walked straight up to the Prophet وسلم, and Omar ibn Khattab and was like, Ya Rasulullah, what about the women? She came from Lighthouse. <laughs> I'm the, those kind of women, they come from Oakland. You know? Alhamdulillah. So she just, boom, right to the point. Omar, is, his mouth is agape. Like, the Prophet looks at Omar, Ya Omar. What do you think about that? Wallahi, I didn't even know women could do that. <laughs> he smiles, oh my, this is Adi. He turns to her. What about the women? What would make a woman do that? My heart is tired of not being noticed. My heart is tired of being on the outside. My heart is tired of being excluded. My heart is tired of not having access. My heart is broken that other people get to sit, sit with the Messenger of Allah وسلم, and I sit from afar and just watch and just yearn and just hope and just wish that I could be close to him, that I could learn from him. My heart is tired from that. And if I just don't take my chance, maybe I'll just walk away from this community. I, you know, I don't feel as if I'm valued. So I'm going to take my chance. So in that moment, the Prophet وسلم, saw her heart. See, we were thinking about her words and her harshness. And, you know, we're thinking about that, her character, her boldness. But sometimes that kind of boldness comes from a broken heart. And the Prophet وسلم, saw her heart and said, you know, and he said, what about the women? What about them? He said, we want access to you, Ya Rasulullah. What's day? Tuesday. I'll be there. <laughs> right? So that became the day that the Prophet them. Tuesday became the day that the Prophet them sat for women. That that was his day. He came to the masjid just to teach them. Just to teach them. You know who he brought with him? You know who he brought with him? Somebody else that might feel left out. That might feel like, you know, I'm not always included. I'm not always viewed a particular way by the community, Ya Rasulullah. So the Prophet Sallallahu took Bilal. Radi Allah Ta'ala Said Bilal, I know how people make you feel. I know how people break your hearts in community. Come be beside me. Me and you gonna hang out. Not only that, I'm gonna empower you. The same way I empowered those women. I'm gonna, you're gonna, you're gonna do something that every single masjid, every prayer, they're gonna do what you did. They're going to call the then, and for people who used to look down to you, I'm going to uplift you. You're going to walk on their shoulders and you're going to stand on top of the Kaaba. And you're going to call the then from on top of the Kaaba. And it's not, yes, it's for you to uplift you, to empower you, to heal your heart and let you know how much I value you and I love you. I'm not going to dismiss you, dismiss your concerns. The same way, subhanAllah, when someone called Bilal, oh, you son of a black woman, he came to the Prophet and said, I'm like, Ya Rasulullah, like this is, 
This is what this Muslim said about me. My brother that I'm standing with in Salah, this is what he said about me. Now, the Prophet وسلم, said, could have said, well, you are a son of a black woman. Right? But he saw his heart. I understand what's happening. Your brother broke your heart. Because he discriminated against you. So he doesn't say, Bilal, come on, be strong. Leave it. You are a son of a black woman. Why are you worried? He didn't dismiss him. He listened. He recognized what the problem is. He turned to the one with the sick heart and said, you still have jahiliyyah in your heart. He reprimanded him. So when we are in positions where someone comes to us and says, I'm, I'm feeling discriminated, I'm feeling excluded. I'm feeling like, you know, I want to be close, I want to have, you know, I want to be have that brotherly and sisterly love, but I'm feeling brokenhearted. I'm not feeling like I'm getting a, a part of that. We don't dismiss them. We let them know how we value them. We raise them up. Hey, we let their voice shine through the crowd. We look at their strengths, subhanAllah, and say, wow, look, Bilal, one of the great, he was a great mathematician. He was great at math, he was great at business. He became the Ministry of Finance. So I don't want them to think that the only thing you can do is sing well. I want them to respect your mind. And it's not like, a, you know, you're not, it's not tokenism, you're qualified. But I see you. I see you're qualified. I, I see you. So that's another way. The other one, of course, the, the one we always, and he smiled. He smiled. He would smile at people and make them feel like, you know that feeling when someone smiles so bright? And they make you feel so welcome. You wonder, like, are they smiling at somebody else? <laughs> what? Me, like, it's me? Me? <sighs> Something about that smile just like warms your heart. It's healing. All right? And so he would smile at people with a beautiful smile. Any of them, subhanAllah, give them salam. He passed by the women making salah or in the masjid. Salamu alaikum. He wasn't the oldest woman in the masjid. No, salamu alaikum. I see you. You're not invisible. I see you. You're not so, you're not a fitna to the point that I can't give you salam. I see you. I mean, of course, who doesn't want a salam from a prophet? Salamu <laughs> If the prophet sends salam on you, right? I just want to be in the masjid. Got a salam. <laughs> Allah, 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 Allah. The next one is that subhanAllah for the worried heart. There was a man in the, his masjid. And he was sitting and he was weeping and he was clearly worried. And he was stressed. And the prophet وسلم, came noticed him, sat next to him. What's wrong? What's wrong? He started to tell the Prophet ﷺ about his debts and his bills and like all oh, his, he started to just literally pour his heart out to the Prophet ﷺ. The Prophet ﷺ made dua for him but also gave him a dua. So when, come, when someone comes to you, right? It's like, well, let's, let's make dua together. I'm going to pray for you. But also, subhanAllah, this, here's a dua. Do you know a dua? Right? He gave him, Allahumma na'udhu bika min in, Allahumma na'udhu bika min ham wa hazan, wa a'udhu bika min ajiz wa kasar, wa a'udhu bika min jubun wa bukhul, wa a'udhu bika min ghalaba tadaini wa qahr rijal. He gave him that dua. Which also is like, he gave him like a comprehensive <laughs> dua. Right? That was specific. Min ghalaba tadaini wa qahr rijal. Like he gave him one specific, okay, you're complaining about your debt and you're overpowered by, you know, people are, you know, demanding their money from you. 
but also I see that it's worrying you. Allahumma na'udhu bika min ham wa hazan. Right? Then like, so he's saying, I, I see you, I see what it's doing to you, so I'm going to give you this dua. Right? That's for the whole of your condition. When you're crying for yourself, and by the way, crying is a big healer. We know that the Prophet ﷺ, when his children passed away, he wept. When Khadija passed away, he wept. When he missed you, he wept. There's a time he's sitting in his masjid and he's crying so profusely that his beard, his beloved beard is dripping with tears. Dripping wet. And the companions are like, Ya Rasulullah, what's wrong? So I miss my brothers. I miss them. I said, Ya Rasulullah, we're right here. I said, no. You're my companions. My brothers and my sisters, they're the ones that they believe in me and they've never seen me. They love me, they've never met me. They sing salawat. They've never seen my face. He longed for you the way you longed for him. He yearned for your company the way you yearn for his company. So he shared in our brokenheartedness from missing each other. So of course, crying for yourself and for others. Cry in sujood. Cry for your brothers and sisters. That becomes a healing, subhanAllah. When you make dua, right, for them, Allah also answers the, your, the dua for you as well. But it becomes a healing. They just, subhanAllah, they split. You ever felt like I can feel somebody praying for me? I, I can feel somebody is making dua for me. Right? Because I'm getting strength that I just, I know I didn't have. Somebody is making dua for me. Especially when they're on Umrah or they're on Hajj or you're like, somebody's like, I, I just sent, right? I just made dua for you in front of the Kaaba. You're like, I felt it. I knew it. <laughs> right? But even that message, you just all of a sudden feel like, Alhamdulillah, it's gonna get, things are going to get better. Because you know, somebody cares enough about me to mention my name to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. To remember me when I'm not with them. To remember me in my absence. That's a huge healing. That you'll show that I'm concerned about you. I care about you. This is what the Prophet ﷺ, if we were to list the ways that he mended hearts, he was relatable. He saw people. He saw their hearts. And then he empowered them. He included them. He made dua for them. He gave dua to them. He smiled upon them. He cared genuinely. And he listened to them. Whether he had the answer or not. Sometimes you're like, I, I actually don't have the answer for that. Other than let's make dua together. It doesn't always mean you have, you know, the answer. You don't always have to have the like, I can solve this problem. Maybe there's some khidmah that you can do to help. Or maybe it's one of those situations that you're just like, all you can say is that is tough. Let's make dua right now for Allah to remove that burden from you and to heal your heart. I'm going to ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to, to heal you to comfort you. I'm gonna sit and make a specific dua. I'm gonna sit and say a hundred, Ya Latif, Ya Latif for you. I can see that you're afflicted by many things. I'm gonna sit and when I make my adhkar, I'm gonna definitely make you a part of my intention when I'm reading my adhkar. So these are the ways, subhanAllah, just also being in community, suhba with each other. It's healing, subhanAllah, it's healing, it's healing.
Subhanak Allahumma wa bihamdik ashadu wa la ilaha ila anta wa nastaghfiruka wa natubu ilayk. Any questions? Any questions? Another thing I want to say, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi used to laugh with people. When they would talk about things, he would listen, and when they laughed, he would laugh. I don't know about you, but the thought of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam laughing, the thought of his beautiful teeth to the point that you could see his molars, <laughs> that's human. <laughs> yes. So when you send salawat on the Prophet وسلم, you have two dhikrs in between. You have the mention of Allah and the Prophet وسلم, right? You say, Allahumma salli ala Sayyidina Muhammad. Right? So it is a dua. So you're mentioning, you're, you have dhikr of Allah while dhikr of the Prophet So I don't want you to think that if you send salawat on the Prophet وسلم, right? Because what do you say? Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So there's, if you mention the Prophet وسلم, and you're sending salawat, you have mentioned Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So I don't want you to think that uh, like these are, you know, separate. So uh, when is a good time to send salawat? Every time, every time, any time. <laughs> you say in the morning, in the night, in the afternoon, after after your prayers, during, you know, on, of course, Laylatul Jum'ah, right? Laylatul Jum'ah, Jum'ah itself. Rabia al awal. Sha'ban, Ramadan, Muharram, <laughs> all of it. Send salawat on the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Why? Wa sallimu like even in sending salawat on the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, you're obeying a command from Allah. Because Allah says, Sallu alayhi wa sallimu taslima. Right? So even in that salawat, you're, you're in a state of ibadah. You're in a state of, of obeying a, a specific commandment from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. In addition to, you're choosing to place yourself in the company with Allah and his angels. Why? Because Allah says, Inna Allahu malaikatu. Right? That Allah and the angels are sending salawat on the Prophet. So if you sit and send salawat on the Prophet, now you're in the company of Allah and his angels. Right? So now, when can you do as ma'as for... Asma al husna Except uh, post matter relay, that's the only time. <laughs> Don't. Any other that? Bismillah. Would you like to say more about that? Well, that's beautiful. <laughs> yes. Marital relations. Post marital relations. <laughs> post marital relations. That's, just, that's not the time. <laughs> yes. Or marital relations. Before, but not after before. You got me? Yes, you with me. Yes. You can do it in both states, but being in a state of wudu is best. Right? The only time is not in the state of Janaba. Anybody else? Yes, Bismillah. Wa alaikum salatullah. Yes. She said, how can we heal a broken heart when someone has passed away? Yeah. So the, one of the things is that recognize that you are definitely in the sunnah of the Prophet wasallam. Number one, he was sad when someone passed away. So I don't want you to necessarily think that uh, that, that broken heart is a bad thing. Right? Like that's actually a sign that your heart is alive and a sign of mercy. But the other thing is, is that the remembrance that this dunya is not forever, inshallah, you'll see them again. Especially if they're, they're Muslim, alhamdulillah, you're going to see them again, inshallah. Um, and their levels, right? Their levels. For example, even in the case of Nabi Allah Yaqub, when he lost Yusuf, he, we know that he cried until, subhanAllah, there's a coating over his eyes. But he was like, I'm just going to complain of my grief and sorrow to Allah. So he never stopped making dua. Right. 
And the truth of it is that subhanAllah, Allah, this, this love that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala puts in our hearts, you know, it's, it's, it's from Al-Wadud. So, we just keep asking Allah, Ya Rabbi, grant them Husnul Khatma, Ya Rabbi, please bless me to be in Jannah with them, and make so much du'a for them, maybe establish a Salaq al Jariyah for them. There are things, I, what I learn is that subhanAllah, the, the relationship with that person is not over. See, sometimes we think like death, I used to think ah, like death is such a final thing. One of my family members passed away and it was extremely difficult for me. It was the first time in my life that I was like, okay, I'm, you know, after a year, I was like, okay, now I'm willing to go to therapy. This is just not getting better, <laughs> right? So, but I was thinking that my relationship with them was over. But then what I learned is that it's not over. If, if they're Muslim, subhanAllah, there's so many things that you can do to keep that relationship going, right? Dua for them, sadaqah for them, different things that you can do for them, that subhanAllah, that the relationship is not, it's not, it's not final. That inshallah bi idni rabbi, also make dua, ya rabbi, please give them jannah. Make their grave spacious. Let them be visited by the Prophet wasallam. I can recite Quran and give it to them. Hey, there are different things that you can do for them, inshallah, so that you keep that relationship going. And be idni rabbi, they will visit you in your dreams. Inshallah. I just find that comforting when I see them. Yes. One of the first things is that there, we always have to know that there is something to smile about. Even, subhanAllah, in all of the darkness and the crazy. Then I'll give you an example. There was a, a mother, and every, probably we all heard this narration, maybe. If there was a mother who, long story short, uh, this was in Gaza. And she basically, long story short, they had gotten, they were told to go from one place to another. And they, you know, did what they were told. But as they started to walk from the north to the south to the Rafa border at that time, then bombs started to go off. So she had gotten separated from her son. So as her son was running toward her, basically a bomb separated them. And, you know, of course, this, you know, just her heart as a mother, hey, subhanAllah. That night she had a dream. The, the, the story is from her. She said that night she had a dream of her son. And, he, and she asked him what happened. He said, Mama, I don't know. I was running toward you. And then all of a sudden I was running like to run toward you in the street. And then all of a sudden I saw myself running in a garden. When I think about the hadith of the Prophet وسلم, saying that the, the parents who've lost their children in the dunya, that they are with Prophet Ibrahim السلام, in this beautiful garden, and that they will stand at the gateways of paradise, and on the day of judgment, they will cry out to Allah asking for their parents. And Allah just to quiet their, to, to remove their cries and to calm their heart, will bring them their parents and they will enter into Jannah with their parents hand in hand. That's what I think about that keeps me smiling. It's, you know, I, I might be a little bit odd, but even when I think about the in the, in the moment of Uhud, the companions uh, met with the disbelievers. And they were looking over the bodies. And as they were looking over the bodies, at first, the kuffar were laughing. And then the Muslims started to laugh and have like beautiful smiles. And the disbelievers were like, why are you laughing? <laughs> and they said, because your dead are in hellfire and our dead are in Jannah. <laughs> right? And I can, like for us, it's not the end. Right? For us, if you, like, the dunya is not the end. Like Allah is going to have the final say. And just the thought of subhanAllah, like, even just thinking how Allah is sending, subhanAllah, people to Jannah, like shuhada, 
we were thinking like this was just for the time of the Sahaba. Right? And yet Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is giving us that chance. Like Subhan al Khaliq. Subhan al Khaliq. With, and you know, I live in a place that, alhamdulillah, has so much beauty, to be honest. So much beauty, so much light, so much noor. But yet, yeah, there's so much poverty in certain areas. And so much, like, so much sickness. You know, sometimes we go to rural areas and you're like, And yet they smile and greet me and sing and sing salawat. And I'm like, children who have no parents, children who have all kinds of diseases and they're smiling. I met this little boy about four days ago. And he came and he kissed my hand and he was like, the, he was the, I mean, the sweetest little boy. I, I mean, just like, you know, the sweetest just so, oh my goodness. He came and he kissed my hand and he said, I want you on Celebrate Mercy. <laughs> and he was so, so sweet. I mean, I just can't tell you how sweet he was. And he just sat there with me, and he was just like talking to me. He was mostly just listening. And he, to be honest, you know, you just have some children. They're just like you are just so angelic, right? His mom was weeping, and my scheduler who was with me said, "Make du'a for him." His mom says that he has a chronic disease, and I was like, "Subhanallah!" Does he know? She's like, yeah, he knows. <laughs> I was like, la ilaha illallah. Hey, I was like, this, I, that was like this little sheikh right here. What? <laughs> like, it's subhanallah bihamdi, subhanallah adim. And again, no, it's not popular in our culture, right? Do we smile him? Ah, <laughs> Just keep your, keep your light. Don't let them dim our light. Don't let them take our smile. They're not worthy of that. They don't get to rip our smiles off our faces. Mm -mm, no, they don't. <laughs> they don't, uh-uh. They don't deserve that. To not smile? Yes, to smile. Yeah. I, fi I find our smiles to be a resistance. Our smile is a resistance. Yeah? Tell me not to smile. Allahu <laughs> Akbar. Alhamdulillah. In addition to when you smile, it, it, there's a, it does something to the heart, right? It uplifts the heart. Alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah. Okay, dear brothers, what's your question? I know you got one, right? You have one? Just raise your brother, hand, brothers. Come on. Got to do this. MashaAllah, Tubaraka Rahman. I have one from online. I'm one of the online viewers, I'll read it off to you. Stella. How can I mend a broken heart from spiritual abuse? I was spiritually abused by a Muslim brother who preys on comfort sisters. I no longer feel comfortable going to the mosque because the leadership has done nothing and he is there often. What do I do? The, one of the first thing is, is that Definitely, 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 there are counselors who are specialists in spiritual abuse. Let me say that. The second thing is, definitely, less than male, if, it's, if, it's, if you're able, find another masjid or another place where you can, that person can go. Another thing is, like, it's as challenging as it is, and I feel like this is a question for Dr. Rania, honestly. Because sometimes, of course, uh, a certain type of trauma makes us feel um, not comfortable, not easy, or has, have anxiety in places, right? In crowds, in people, in places that, are, that remind us of that trauma. And so I know, subhanAllah, that's not, that's not always easy. So that's a, that's a process, just like any other 
you know, uh, any other trauma. It's a process to heal from that. Two small things I want to say, and I definitely want to hear from Dr. Rania on this one. One is never blame Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for what people do. Right. What people's diseases are not the deen. They're people's diseases. The other thing is, is that at least part of how I deal with certain things that have happened in my life, I always try to uh, say, you know what? This person does not have right to my heart. They don't have right to my personality. They don't have, so let me remove, right, whatever that person has done, let me give it back to them. Let me give them back their trauma. Let me give them back their issues. Let me hand that back to them and remove myself, right? Because they don't have, it, it, there, for me, there is a certain resistance in saying, I don't give you permission to affect me for the rest of my life. I don't give you permission to dictate my spirituality. I don't give you permission to dictate where I go and come. I will just, I just wanted to say about the spiritual abuse discussion is that for this person who's asking, this is real. I want you to know that this is real. And as many times as people try to tell you that it's not, I want you to know that it is a possible type of trauma and abuse. There are good resources out there Please take a look at our teachers who've worked on this topic in particular, Dr. Ingrid Madsen, who has the Hurma Project. She has a podcast on this topic as well, and a lot of resources, defining it, understanding it, healing from it, counselors that work with it. That way you have a better sense, inshallah. And please do not feel that you have to be the one who calls out this person publicly. Although we hope that a group of people will come forward together because we know that Perpetrators only stop when they're publicly shamed and called out, unfortunately. It's part of human psychology. And this is why in our dean we have measures in place to do such a thing, but there's no vigilantism either. So you do not have to do this on your own or by yourself, but I want you to know that this is real. And I pray that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala heals your heart. But you're absolutely right, Shaykha. This person and no person has control over your heart or your dean. May you heal and move forward, inshallah in better ways, Ya Rabbi. Mean. Okay. Brothers. Wa alaikum salatullah. I was wondering the hadith that you share often about the tradition of the woman who approaches the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu mm -hmm. and she has mental health issues and he says, go to any street, go any area and you'll find me there. Do you ever think about or apply that hadith in a way that's relevant to us, where the Prophet Muhammad isn't physically near, but just to go to him when we have ideas or we're struggling with uh, whatever we may be struggling with, but falling back on that hadith as a reassurance that we can find him where we look for him? Yes. <laughs> Even inside of that, in the ayah, that Allah commands us to send salawat on the Prophet and we're not always in Medina, right? So the, the answer to that is absolutely, <laughs> absolutely, yes and yes and yes again. <laughs> Bismillah, yes. Yes, I can tell you about the orphanage, the Yontaro project for which this QR code is for. So in the Gambia, uh, the name of the project is called Yantaro Project. Yantaro uh, means the blessed collective, which comes from Nana Asma'u. Nana Asma'u went to over 800 villages in West Africa, literally teaching sacred knowledge, uh, giving women economic empowerment, as well as like building clinics and building schools. And so that's what we're trying to do, literally follow in that legacy. Uh, mostly what we're trying to do is go to heaven. To be honest, let me just keep it real. Well, uh, is that, that inside the Yantaru project, there are, we focus mostly on things that are Sadaqah Jariah related, 
So one of them is, of course, is which not, you know, all of us are like, we're trying to go to Jannah with the Prophet them. And so the Prophet them said that whoever takes care of an orphan will stand next to me like this on your muqiyama. So I'm like, yes, that's what I got to do. Bismillah. <laughs> so um, what we have, subhanAllah, is a school. And in the Gambia, alhamdulillah, we have, so we take care of a number of orphans. And let me uh, kind of give a, a, a short little demonstration for how that goes. So the first thing is that we have our own school, Horaya Academy, which is a boarding school where there are 20 orphans currently in our direct care. And they, they're, they're also integrated. So it's not just, our, our goal is for them to feel like you know, they're a part of everyday society. We don't want to constantly, like, I don't call them orphans, I call them my babies, right? But to let them know that, you know, you are with other children, you are, you know, you are valuable enough to receive the same education, right? Clothing, shelter, medical care as other children. As we would want, subhanAllah, if, if may Allah forbid, if something were to happen to us, that we would want that for our children. So, um, but alhamdulillah, it's challenging to take care of 20 children, right? And we currently have 43 that are on the waiting list. So the children that are in our direct care came from very rural areas. So we build solar-powered water systems uh, in rural areas where there is no running water. A lot of times there's no running electricity, which is why they're solar-powered. Uh, as a result, when, there is, when there's just a well or no running water, there's high level of death as it relates to, you know, waterborne illness like parasitic infection. Um, of course, water that's affected by ground contamination. A lot of times girls can't go to school as a result for having to walk sometimes an hour, sometimes more one way to get water and bring it back. So because they're considered, you know, that girls, uh, you know, if we had to choose between who would work in the family, the boys would go and the girls would fetch the water for the family. So then girls can't go to school as a result of that, of having that job in the family. Um, in addition to, of course, as a result of them walking long distances, let's just say many things can happen to them along the way. So what we do is we build underground, as you know, we dig to the deep clean water aquifers and put in um, basically a solar powered pump. And then we bring taps uh, to either a central region or to houses. So that means the girls can go to school, it reduces the water infection. Of course, when there's an open well, mosquito swarm causes malaria, childhood blindness, all kinds of problems. So we actually, even if we go to an area that has a well, we seal it and dig it underground as we, we have, right? Underground pipes and things like that, which literally, subhanAllah, when those girls can go to school, you literally, subhanAllah, change the trajectory, not just for their lives, but for that entire village. Um, and then, of course, you know, subhanAllah, it reduces the illness and the sickness, which reduces the amount of orphans who actually are in that community. But meanwhile, there are a lot of orphans in those regions. So then it's not, when a child is orphaned, uh, many times there's no one to pay for them. It's, it's not just their school fees, even though there are school fees. Uh, it's usually like, who's going to pay for their books? Who's going to give them backpacks and, you know, you know, pay for their food when they go to school or their... Uh, you know, notebooks and pens and uniform and those things that even if you're in public school, you have to have uniform. So a lot of times children who are orphaned, they don't have that. So then there's nobody to care for them. So as a result, they end up just kind of being um, used as like manual labor in someone's home, right? Um, and they usually don't have a good quality of life. So in those, a lot of those villages, what we did for those that we could currently house, we actually brought them into our facility. That's why they're boarding there. So that when they live there, we know that they're going to get breakfast, they're going to get lunch, they're going to get dinner, they're going to get, you know, someone who will care for them, give them medical care, dental care, make sure, you know, they're bathed properly. We make sure, we, we take care of them. Like you, you know, uh, literally like our own children. Um, so that's, that's the project in the Gambia. That's the project in the Gambia. So if you are interested in orphan care or sponsoring an orphan, please let me know. Or you can go to the QR code and there's a link for that. Right now we're raising, we're having like a back to school because they start school September 30th. 
So we're looking for, you know, we're trying to, it's a back to school campaign where we can get new uniforms for them because they grow, alhamdulillah, they're growing fast now, right? And as well as they need backpacks and, you know, all the things, all the things that kids do need when they're going back to school. And so uh, if you're interested in that, when you go to the link, you'll see the uh, back to school campaigns. Or if you're interested in sponsoring the child, yes. Depending on how many you have. You got 20? You have to get a suitcase, but yeah, it's possible. <laughs> Alhamdulillah. Inshallah. Inshallah. Yes, they are the cat eligible. <laughs> Well, alhamdulillah, I'm ready. <laughs> Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. Wa salatu wa salam ala sayyidina habibina mawlana Muhammad. Wa ana anihi wa sahbihi wa sallam. Ya awal al-awalin, ya akhir al-akhirin, ya dhukuwat al-matin, ya rahm al-masakin, ya rahm al-rahimin. Ya Rabbi, we ask that you bless every single one of these people in this masjid tonight. Ya Rabbi, to be from amongst the inhabitants of Jannah to Firdaus al-Ana. Ya Rabbi, bless them to see the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in their dreams. Ya Allah. Ya Rabbi, make us from amongst those who have fitur. Ya Rabbi, increase us in knowledge and in wisdom. Ya Rabbi, heal our hearts, Ya Allah. Ya Rabbi, we ask that you illuminate our hearts with a light from your light and a guidance from your guidance, Ya Arhamur Rahimin, and make us from amongst those who have success in this life and success in the hereafter and make this gathering a means by which we're all saved from the torment of the grave, the punishment, the hellfire, even for the blink of an eye. Ya Rabbi, please protect and preserve our children and those that are close to us and love us and our entire lineage to Yawm Al-Qiyam. Ya Rabbi, bless MCC forever, Ya Allah, and all of our teachers and, and all those who support this community. Subhanakallahumma wa bihamdik. Ashadu wa la ilaha ala anta wa nastaghfiruka wa natubu ilayk. Allahumma ameen. Jazakimina and khair. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Takbir.